Well, well, well. Hello, chat. Did I surprise you? Just kidding. If you watch my streams, you know that I'm gonna do Saturday streams now. Look who came crawling back. Well, well, well. Hi, chat. We're doing something a little experimental. Is this gonna be the usual Saturday time going forward? I actually don't know. Uh, I actually do not know. But basically, <laughs> whether or not, um, uh, either way, like, I have plans later today, so I, I wasn't going to do a late stream either way, even if I intend on doing late streams on Saturdays. Uh, is the light commentary mean there won't be much, or you're gonna keep it lighthearted? This is important. I don't, I don't know what you mean. <laughs> I, I might do a little react andying. Maybe. But it's gonna be mostly reading. Um, Junie has never been lighthearted in her life. That's not true, I'm very lighthearted. That announcement looked good. Uh, hang on, my hype train is covering up the announcement. <laughs> the hype train's covering up the, the pin. Oh, okay. Yeah, 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 thank you. Thank you, Regan. That works. Uh, hey, thanks for the 35 months, Sir Killington. Uh, thanks for the 28 months, Momo. Thanks for the sub, Spader. Thanks for the Prime. Thanks for the ad, uh, uh, the, the 20 months, Admiral Teacup. Uh, thanks for the six months, Serial. Thanks for the nine months, Seth. Thank you. Um, we're, we're gonna do, like, a bit of a slow intro, I think, just because nobody fucking... Anybody who isn't literally in my stream as I'm saying it probably doesn't fucking know that I'm streaming right now. So I'll just let the notification hit or whatever. Mm. Well, hello, chat. Happy Saturday! Yeah, I know that the game- yeah, the game hits the ground running. Uh, I have played- played. It's hard for me to say. It, is it played or read if it's a visual novel chat? E either way, I've I've read maybe like the first 10 minutes of this game. Um, I, I was actually going to do it all on my own, but then I stopped and I was like, this is, this is Judy Core as fuck. This is Judy Core as fuck. And I feel like my, my viewers would really like to experience this with me. Um, hey, thanks for the tier three, Safkiel. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fake reaction only for the first 10 minutes. Then it's all, all, basically I'm going in blind. Um, I, uh, am I peeking? I'm a little loud. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, they're, uh, I'm mostly going in blind. I know about this game. I know that it's really famous. I know that the author went on to work on uh, a, a bunch of other very, very notable works including Madoka, and for those of you who don't know, I am a fucking huge fan of Madoka Magica. Not work, create, okay, they created Madoka, they didn't just work on it. Yeah, huge fucking fan of Madoka, so I'm very, very interested to see this person's other works. And apparently this is their most bleak, most nightmarish work. <laughs> apparently this game is a fucking nightmare. Uh, I guess I'll do warnings once we start. Once we get into it. But, but I'm gonna sit on it for a few more minutes. Yeah, are you guys ready to go into the flesh pit? Come on. Come on, come on. Okay, hold on. I need to actually turn down my mixer just a touch. Because I think I kicked it. Ow, fuck. <laughs> I think I kicked my mixer again, chat. Oh yeah, oh yeah, chat. This game is fucking flesh core. 
Yeah, are you ready for the thrilling gameplay of clicking or hitting enter for three hours? Actually, chat, I'm probably only going to do two hours. Uh, I, I mean, like, after after I actually start. Um, because uh, I have shit that I'm, I, I have plans later tonight. So I don't have a ton of time. Yeah, I know everybody's going to be asking about, like, sensor patches and stuff. Allegedly... Allegedly, uh, the Steam version is safe. Even if it isn't safe, what are they gonna do, chat? Ban me for three days? What are they gonna freaking do? I, I at least put in the legwork to check the internet and with without like spoiling myself and be like, is this safe to stream? And it seems like it is. It shows boob once. Yeah, who cares? Eh, who cares? It's, uh... You know, if it's artistic, whatever. I mean, I've said this before, but, like, we literally had two twins with their cocks out chasing us an outlast. How much, how much worse could it be? Come on. <laughs> With their cocks fully out, chasing us down in Outlast. Fully out! It's worse. Whatever. Whatever, whatever. It'll be fine. It'll be fine, chat. Uh, I am aware. I am aware that this, uh, that this game has a lot of very, very fucked up mature content. Um... But it's okay, because all of us are adults, or at least all of us should be adults. Because I do have the, like, mature content warning tag on my stream. And that's just the most I can do. <laughs> Am I an adult? Who's to say? Who's to say? <laughs> yeah, but I don't anticipate that um, people are gonna like misbehave in chat or whatever. I think it'll be fine. Even if Twitch bonks me, it's whatever. It's something I have to, like I haven't ever been Twitch bonked before. So I need to test, I need to like litmus test anyways, right? Yeah, there may or may not be sexual violence, I think. We'll see. First time for everything, baby. I got to I got to figure out where the line is. And I got to tow it. I got to ride that line. Junie is someone that was called emotionally mature as a child, but never age past that point mentally. Eh, wrong. I've done more emotionally maturing uh, these past couple years alone than my entire teenage years. <laughs> Incorrect. I am, I'm very mature for my age. That's gross. Should I ever say that? No. Like, I'm kidding. Oh, fuck, God damn it! I, w I like, zoned out, and I just, I, I mostly drink most of my tea. I have, like, tea with honey in it, because, uh, back chat, when I was doing the Sir Bronte streams, um, yeah, uh, reading for extended periods of time will hurt my, like, throat, and I don't think I'm gonna be used to it, so that's why I'm only gonna, another reason I'm probably only gonna be going for, like, two hours. Uh, thanks for the 11 months, the old Nile. And thanks, Starfish, for the 21. Thank you. And thank you, Nesco, for the five gifted subs. Sorry, I missed that earlier. Thank you so much. Can you do anything without breaking down? <laughs> yeah. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <sighs> All right, I'm gonna give it another couple minutes. Then we go. 
It's gonna be very chill, very low energy. <laughs> Just some low energy, chill, psychological horror, that's all. Was that furrow post on Twitter related to the Scara art by any chance? No, it wasn't. It was something else. I was going insane. I felt like I was going insane. Yeah, just cozy nightmare fuel. Just some, like, cozy gore. Some comfy horror. Some... <laughs> the usual. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Actually, I am going to... I'm going to fill up my water bottle. I'm going to make sure it's topped off. Uh, so I'm going to mute my mic. I'll be back in just like one second. And after that, uh, I think we'll probably get into it. Because, I mean... I think this, this, like... I think this stream might have more value as a VOD, basically. I've explained my reasons why. Anyways, BRB. Hello, chat. Welcome. Welcome to hell. <laughs> Welcome to hell. We're gonna be going in together today. Are you excited? We're gonna get some freaking bonding in, chat. You and I. You and I in the, the fucking... The flesh nightmare. <laughs> um... I am going to do an audio check once we start, uh, because this game is fully voiced in Japanese. Uh, but instead of muting the voice acting, I've turned it down very, very low. And I'm going to just talk over it like a translator would. Does that make sense? But I don't want the audio to get confusing or bad. Does that make sense? Uh, let me push my OBS over here. Mm, yum, 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 yum. Yeah, what a clean, nice intro screen. It looks like it would taste like mint. Isn't that lovely? All right, I'm gonna turn on a lamp really quick and then we, then we go, okay? Then we freaking get it. And we're not gonna get in trouble. Uh, and this game is safe to stream on Twitch. And, um, <laughs> and there definitely isn't, like, <laughs> incredibly horrible kinds of violence in it. <laughs> All right, baby, let's get it. Okay. I don't like it when I start giggling. When she starts giggling. <laughs> They're going to be asking these questions for the next two hours. We'll respond for you. Yeah, so uh, as soon as we start, I'm going to shut the fuck up. I'm probably not going to talk to you guys at all. Um, unless something happens and I have to react Andy it. Okay? Okay. The story is a work of fiction. The procedures and conditions described herein are imaginary. Slow down. The wriggling mass of flesh burbles. Three such creatures sit around the table in front of me, slurping filthy sludge from their cups as they trade whines, growls, and sounds that I cannot understand or describe.
By listening carefully, I'm able to grasp the gist of their conversation and respond when it is required of me. This is necessary to avoid arousing their suspicion. However these creatures look, they are my friends, apparently. I wish that I could still deny it, but I gave up on that a long time ago. Night after night, I went to sleep praying for an end to this nightmare, only to wake up each morning to the same twisted hellscape as the day before. You guys can see my cursor, can't you? Can I hide that? One sec. I fixed it, sorry. <laughs> I know now that I have to blend in, that I have to act like one of them. Such has been my life these past three months, and so it will remain until the day I die. Judging by its tone, this one must be Koji, and the one next to him, squealing more than the others, is probably Omi. Which means that the one next to me is Yo, although I can no longer see any trace of her once attractive features. I try my best to ignore the rotten stench of excre excrement that issues from her quivering flesh. Hey guys, you can't hear it because I turned it down really quiet, but these are like, they are voiced. It's just incomprehensible. <laughs> Actually, is the music too loud? Audio check? This is the audio check I was talking about doing. Okay. Everything has changed. Or almost everything. By some cruel trick of fate, my relationship to the world alone remains the same, as if an insane architect took the blueprints of my life and rebuilt it out of blood and gore. These monsters and I were part of the same college club. We studied together, ate together, we even went skiing together every winter break. Now, these are but painful memories of days that will never return. If only no one recognized me, I might have been able to disconnect myself from the world. It would have been comforting, in comparison, to believe that I had been abducted by aliens or that I had stumbled through a gateway to hell. But no. This is, beyond a doubt, the city where I was born and raised, the society that I was part of for 20 years. Save that I, and I alone, can no longer see it that way. The world as I knew it is gone. I have no place to call home. Anyway, I can tell that whatever they're discussing is of no importance to me. I decide to keep quiet while pretending to listen. But just then... Hey, Fuminori! One of the flesh beasts says as it swivels its bloodshot eyes towards me, What do you think? About what? I try desperately to suppress my loathing and behave normally, but my hoarse voice ruins the attempt. Uh, we're talking about this year's ski trip. You're coming too, right? A slimy hole near the top of the creature writhes nauseatingly as it vomits some semblance of words. That must be Koji's face, or what I would have seen as such three months ago. Unable to stomach the sight of it, I avert my eyes and give a neutral answer. I don't know. You have other plans? Not really. These were my closest companions. One of them had even wished to be more. How many nights have I spent crying in loneliness, lamenting the friends who no longer exist? In three months, my tears ran dry, and now there is only loathing left in me. Surrounded by hideous creatures that I can only assume are Koji, Omi, and Yo. I spend each day trying to act as I always have. If I fail at this, I'll surely be sent back to the hospital. Only this time, I'll be locked away forever. No matter what, I won't let that happen. I mean, it's not like physical activity could affect your injuries, right? I'm not sure. I'll ask the doctor during my checkup. That's it. I can't look at them or bear their screeching any longer. I jump to my feet, desperate to escape. Hey, Fuminori! 
A spray of stringy slime from the silly around its voice box flies at me. I try to cover myself, but too late to keep the slime from splattering across my face like the yolk of a rotten egg. I'm about to lose it. I want to grab a chair, a desk, anything within reach and use it to smash the life out of this creature, ending it all. I barely suppress the impulse. I mustn't let on that something is wrong. However they look to me, this is their world. I am the outsider here. Like I said, today's my checkup. I've got to go. Hang on, chat. Config! Config time. Struggling to put on a smile, I reach into my wallet and pull out the first bill I find and put it on the table without even looking at it. I don't care about the change, I just need to get out of here. Now. Later. I mutter hastily and flee the cafeteria. I'm not crazy. Hey, so is Takahata Omi? Why don't we go somewhere else? Fuck, that's so loud. I'm sorry, we're, fi we're fixing it. <laughs> Just a little adjust- a little adjusting here or there. And then we're never gonna have to touch it again. Why don't we go somewhere we can skate for this year's ski trip? Yo frowns at the suggestion. Skate, but why go to a ski resort to skate? Give her a break, Tsukaba. It's all she talks about these days. Should I just- I should let them just do their voice lines. Sorry. <laughs> we got this. <clears throat> Koji supports Omi with a laugh. Her impromptu suggestions are nothing new, and it's Koji's role as her boyfriend to provide backup. They're a good match for each other, Yo thinks. Sometimes it makes her jealous. <laughs> I mean, she'd seriously never gone skating before I took her the other day. Is it really that strange? Not many people start skating in their 20s, you know. I was scared when I was little. Those shoes looked like big knives. Yeah, hang on. I got this. We calibrate. We... We calibrate. We... Apply. <clears throat> but you picked it up just like that? That's pretty amazing, Omi. It's a lot like skiing. You keep your weight forward and use the angle of the shoes to steer. He made it sound so easy. I figured I should just give it a try. And it was fun. So it was a date. Yo feels a stab of envy. Koji and Omi enjoy their time together as normal lovers do. That's certainly not something that should make her jealous. It's just that her luck and love has been bad. Oh, well, I want to see Omi skate too. Yo keeps her voice upbeat, trying to cover up her disquiet. She knows that it's wrong to envy her friends. She too would be spending time with the man she admires if not for the terrible tragedy that befell him. His true misfortune. Her bad luck doesn't even begin to compare. So, how about it? If we make the next ski trip a skating trip too, it'll be twice as fun. But you can skate at a skating rink, can't you? Why go all the way to a ski resort? I don't want to skate indoors. I want to skate outside on a lake or something. That sounds fun, but won't it be crowded? While speaking, Yo sneaks a sideways glance at the young man sitting next to her. Although the conversation has involved only three people so far, there are in fact two couples at the cafeteria table. Yo's boyfriend, though there's still some doubt over whether he could be called that, is beside her, silent and expressionless as a statue. Hey, Fuminori, what do you think? Perhaps Koji sensed Yo's pain in his usual quiet and considerate way. About what? The cause of Yo's distress, Fuminori, responds to Koji's sudden query with a vague, mumbled question of his own. 
Um, we're talking about this winter ski trip. You're coming too, right? Koji speaks gingerly, although probing a tumor. A few months ago, he would not have hesitated to rebuke Fuminori for his attitude. Their long acquaintance had forged a strong and honest friendship. But now? I don't know. Fuminori responds bluntly, his downcast eyes and sullen demeanor making it clear that he has no desire to break his silence. You have plans? Not really. Even Koji, Fuminori's best friend, cannot communicate with him as before. What hope does Yo have of breaking through his shell? The scars left by the events of that late summer day are still deep all these months later. Each one of the four bears them, not only Fuminori. I mean, it's not like physical activity could affect your injuries, right? Not sure. I'll ask the doctor during my checkup. As though that answer drained the last of his patience, Fuminori bolts out of his chair. Hey, Fuminori! Even Koji can't keep his voice from rising as he tries to stop Fuminori from leaving. Fuminori reacts swiftly, throwing his hand over his face as though to shield himself from something terrifying. Maybe some spit flew inadvertently from Koji's mouth? But that happens sometimes. Fuminori's reaction is beyond the pale. Like I said, Fuminori snaps, making no attempt to relieve the discomfort of his friends. Today's my checkup. I have to go. Even as he tosses the money on the table to pay for his coffee, he acts like he's touching something filthy. Later. Fuminori stalks out of the cafeteria, almost as if he's running away. Cloaked in heavy silence, the remaining three lower their gaze to the table where the abandoned 10,000 yen bill sways forlornly. Fuminori's coffee is untouched. I can't take this anymore, Omi says with a sigh, but Koji shakes his head reproachfully. Fuminori just needs a little more time. But it's been three months. What's with his attitude? I feel like I'm going crazy hanging around him. Hey, I don't understand what he's going through either. I don't think any of us can. 10,000 yen and a mirror box is about $100. Can you imagine losing your whole family like that? That'd screw anyone up. It could have happened to anyone. A tractor trailer flipped over on the highway, crushing the Sakisaka family car into twisted scrap. They said it had been difficult to tell the bodies of Fuminori's parents apart. For a while, it had looked as though there were no, was no hope for Fuminori either. It was nothing short of a miracle that he was able to leave the hospital and return to normal life. He was worse when we went to see him in the hospital, remember? He was terrified of us, like he didn't know who we were. He even had to be tied to the bed, he freaked out so bad. I'm just glad he's made it this far. There's just something strange about him. What's with the way he looks at us? It's like we're not even human. Cut it out, Omi. Koji says forcefully. Probably less out of empathy for his friends than out of consideration for Yo. While Koji's kindness makes her happy, Yo also knows that he mustn't take advantage of it. Fuminori is the victim, just as Koji said. He's the one who deserves the most sympathy. Yo's feelings for Fuminori are her problem and no one else's. She doesn't blame Fuminori for not giving her an answer after she worked up the courage to ask him out. In fact, she thinks even more fondly of him for taking the time to consider time to consider than she would have had if he had treated their relationship casually. Apparently, the fact that Fuminori did not reject her was enough to make them a couple in Koji and Omi's eyes. They have had plenty of fun at Yo and Fuminori's expense since then. The truth of it, though, is that he still hasn't given her an answer. After revealing her feelings to him, Yo didn't see Fuminori again until a week later, and then she could only stare at his broken body through the window of the ICU. And when he was finally released, after 50 days that seemed an eternity, he was somehow different. She's starting to doubt that he even remembers what she confessed to him before the accident. Now winter is coming, and her feelings hang forgotten in the cold, lonely air. <laughs> Dr. Ryoko has never had a more troublesome patient. Any changes since your last visit? No, nothing to speak of. 
I would like to read Higurashi, Hattie, but apparently it's super long. So I'll think about it. It depends on if I end up really liking doing this. <clears throat> His voice is hard and flat, his words tossed carelessly into the air. It's like he's speaking to himself in an empty room. Ryoko is a surgeon, not a psychiatrist, but even she can sense the thickness of the wall he has erected between himself and the world. Any nausea, dizziness, or hallucinations? No. While Sakisaka appears to be looking at Ryoko, his gaze is actually aimed a fraction down and to the side. He's only superficially engaged in the conversation when in truth it does not interest him in the slightest. Perfect rejection. Realizing that she can't interview him like this, Ryoko sighs and sets her chart aside. Mr. Sakisaka, the procedure you received at this hospital was the latest in experimental, no, neurosurgery. We explained this before, didn't we? Treatment of subdural hematoma through the use of micro-machines, a procedure available in Japan exclusively here at T-University, had been the only way to save Sakisaka Fuminori from a cerebral contusion that should have been fatal. With any experimental treatment, there is always the risk of unexpected complications. Of course. Fuminori's lips twist slightly in what might have been a bitter or mocking smile, but it is gone before Ryoko can discern its meaning. Normally, I would never say anything to frighten a patient, but there have been reports of serious neurological disorders post-surgery. We must continue to monitor your condition carefully. Hence these weekly checkups. If only he would take them a little more seriously. How was last week's MRI? Fuminori asks abruptly, as if to catch Ryokyo off guard. MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is a way for doctors to examine the brain in detail without opening the patient's skull. Surprised by Sakisaka's uncommon techno technical knowledge, Ryoko recalls his profile. Oh, that's right. You're a medical student, aren't you? <laughs> Not a med student, bro. The kind of anom anomaly you're worried about should show up on the MRI, right? Did you find anything? No. There was nothing. Not the slightest hint of abnormal activity. For a procedure with such a low rate of success, the results have been nothing short of miraculous. However, something still bothers Ryoko. She can't shake the feeling that he's hiding something beneath his guarded exterior. Something... <laughs> Some terrible weight on his soul, perhaps. But if it's an inorganic problem, then there's nothing she can do, as long as he refuses to explain it. I'm fine. I've been on my own for three months without any problems. What could go wrong now? Please, you know that continued observation is required after these difficult surgeries. You have to trust us a little more. I suppose you're right. I do want to trust you, doctor. Can I come to you with anything? Yes, of course, Ryoko answers, smiling to cover up her irritation. Sakisaka asked exactly the same question during last week's visit. Well then, let's pick up where we left off. Have you learned anything about Dr. Ogai? Uh. <laughs> Unable to answer, Ryoko hardens the mask of her smile. As before, the patient is inquiring about someone whom he has no business knowing. If you don't mind my asking, what does Dr. Ogai have to do with your treatment? You just told me to trust you, now you're keeping secrets? Ryoko's used to patients treating her with hostility. Some degree of paranoia is natural when dealing with a person whose mistakes could kill you. In Sakisaka, however, she doesn't see the anxiety that other patients exhibit. His demeanor is perfectly calm, almost like a detective questioning a suspect. He left this hospital some time ago. I never had any contact with him myself. Do you know why he left? Yes, I believe it was personal, Ryoko answers smoothly, her earlier hesitation gone. Having decided at the outset to lie, she has no trouble doing so with a straight face. Hey chat, I am playing the Steam version, however, 
we have options here. I thought grotesque CGs might just be referring to like gore and monster stuff, but should I blur it? If, if there's something more than that? No? Fully display? Yeah, Reagan, if you could look into it, but you don't need to look too hard. I don't care that much. <clears throat> but why do you keep asking about Dr. Ogai? Are you acquainted? Did you know that that doctor has gone missing? No. Ryoka realizes that her answer may have been a little too quick. She should have acted more surprised. I have recently become close with a relative of his. It was she who asked me to find him. A relative? Ryoko considers this with a frown. I didn't think Dr. Ogai had any relatives. Oh? Who told you that? I heard it from a nurse, Ryoko replies, remembering that she just claimed to have no contact with the man. I see. The doctor was famous enough to have nurses gossiping about him. I hear he was an unusual man, but no one knows why he left the university. Ryoko falls silent, knowing that this isn't a topic she can brush away with a smile. Sakisaka seems to have firmly grasped her mood. However, firmly grasped, I'm sorry. However, as his strangely stiff tone softens a little. Please, I have to find Dr. Ogai. There's a girl who needs him. Can't you help me? Isn't this something the police should handle? Although she makes it sound like the most obvious thing in the world, the suggestion is actually a gamble. If Ogai Masahiko's disappearance becomes a police matter, then the university will be investigated. Everyone who was involved in the incident would be at risk of exposure. And of course, that includes Ryoka herself. She knows, however, that Sakisaka is unlikely to go to the police. First of all, his excuse is obviously a lie. They made sure that Ogai had no relatives who might come looking for him, which is why they could bury the truth of what happened. But then, how did Sakisaka, a mere patient, learn about Ogai? I'd be happy to help, but there's been no word from Dr. Ogai since he resigned last April. I can only assume that he's gone on an extended vacation. I see. Expecting resistance, Ryoko is surprised when Sakisaka backs down. She's still worried about his condition, and the mysterious link between him and Ogai is only making her more uneasy. But as long as he doesn't open up to her, there's nothing she can do. <laughs> After a brief, brief pause, Ryoko writes, Progress good on Sakisaka's chart for today. About next week's appointments, how does four o'clock again sound? Before she can finish, Sakisaka is gone. <laughs> Yay, back to Fleshland! It looks like someone sprayed the walls with pig guts from ceiling to floor. What color should the walls of a hospital be? White, of course, and to the creatures of rotten flesh shambling around me, I'm sure this hallway looks just as white as it should. I know, intellectually, that the walls are white. I know that the flesh beasts are really human. I'm the one with the problem, and it's because I've accepted this that I'm able to lead something approaching a normal life. Even if my university's medical department is nowhere near as good as T universities, I am still a medical student specializing in neurology. I have a basic idea of what has happened to me, though it's hard to believe. This isn't a pathological condition. It's probably some form of agnosia, unlike anything that has ever been studied before. The flesh beast called Ryoko said that the other patients had developed neurological disorders after receiving the same treatment I did. So I guess I'm just another failure. It makes me want to laugh in that know-it-all doctor's face. That said, I don't blame the doctors who operated on me. After all, I do owe them my life. I know as well as anyone how low the chance of success was and that I had no other hope of survival. Give me a second to stretch. I was unlucky. That's all there is to it. The point is that my condition isn't treatable. 
Just like someone adapting to a hearing aid or wheelchair, I have no choice but to adapt to this nauseating scenery. I love the CGs. Of course it's hard. It wasn't easy to resign myself to this fate. But now there's more than just despair. Even for me, there is a glimmer of hope. Keeping my eyes on my feet, I hurry home. Imagine- <laughs> Do you think it's- Do you think if you, like, go for a doorknob, do you think it'd be, like, wet and gooey? I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood in a house that's much too large for me alone. My parents, even unluckier than I was, died in the accident three months ago. I couldn't even go to the funeral for being in intensive care. I had to sell my father's business, but at least that left me with the house and enough money to live on for a while. Of course I'm sad, but the accident took more from me than my parents. In fact, being on my own has probably saved me. If they were still alive, my parents would have never allowed me to live with some strange girl. Is it her? Welcome home! It's Saya! As I open the door, a bright voice greets me from the kitchen. The voice is beautiful and clear as a bell, human. Its sweet sound washes the day's cacophony from my memory. I'm home, Saya. Even the patter of feet coming down the hallway is music to my ears. Nowhere else in the city can I hear such footsteps. Only in this house, with Saya, am I so privileged. She looks like a cat! <laughs> You're late! I was a little worried. Sorry, I had to stop by the hospital today. Oh, that was today. In her smile, in the inquisitive tilt of her head, is everything that I have lost. Since my accident, this girl is the only person I've met. Perhaps the only person in the entire world who does not trigger my cognitive disorder. True, her skin seems too white, and the color of her eyes and hair is probably different in reality. But even so, her form is undeniably human. And it's not just her appearance in her voice, either. As I bend down to take off my shoes, Saya wraps her arms around my neck and pulls me gently into her chest. Her skin feels truly human, not cold or slimy, and from her hair wafts a sweet, feminine fragrance. In all the world, only Saya is pleasing to my five senses. And what's more, she smiles at me, embraces me. She knows that she is my salvation and for some reason is happy that I need her. If I had not met Saya, if I had been all alone in this twisted, filth-ridden world, I would no doubt have succumbed to madness. It is no exaggeration to say that Saya alone is keeping me alive. What did you do today? Worked on the living room. The painting's half done. And now I'm making your dinner, like I learned from the TV. Oh, is she a... Girl, she can't cook. <laughs> Sounds good. It'll take a little longer. Can you wait? Sure. I'll do some more work in the living room. After I see the humming Saya off to the kitchen, I step into the living room. Oh, I realized one day that if the natural colors of the world were sickening, all I had to do was paint over them with colors that seemed pleasant. I went to the hardware store and bought every color paint I could find, and then Saya and I tried different combinations until we found one that worked. After painting the bedroom from ceiling to floor, I was finally able to get my first good night's sleep since the accident. There's definitely a reason he painted it green, yeah? That's like Saya colors. When we first started on the living room, Saya, unsure of what to do with the curtains, just painted carefully around the windows. Without a moment's hesitation, I tore the curtains down and painted over the glass itself. There will never be anything out there that I'd want to see. And as long as we keep the storm shutters closed, then the neighbors probably won't think anything of it. Dinner's ready. Can you bring it in here? As she enters the living room with a tray of food, Saya sniffs the air. The paint smell doesn't bother you? Now that she mentions it, I suppose the smell of paint thinner must be building up in this closed room. It doesn't really bother me, though. There are far worse smells outside. 
No, he's fu he's gassing himself. Does it bother you? No, I'm fine if you are. Saya sets the food on the table. Unfortunately, neither its color nor its smell is at all appetizing. Not that food elsewhere is any different. Thanks, Saya. As has become routine, I seal myself and methodically transport the food into my mouth. The taste is as gut-wrenching as I expected, but it's not Saya's fault. I'm sure she made it exactly like the cooking show said. It's just that my taste buds can't accept it. It's not good? She asks hesitantly. Well, no. Lying won't make Saya happy. She knows about my condition. Don't worry about it. I'll make something different tomorrow. Sorry, you always go through the trouble of cooking, but I... It's fine. If I keep trying, maybe I'll find something you'll like. In my current state, eating is nothing more than an unwelcome duty. As much as I hate it, I need food to survive. If I stay alive, then perhaps one day, as Saya says, I'll be able to taste something delicious again. I met Saya, didn't I? Aren't you going to eat? No, I already ate. In all the time we've been together, Saya has never once eaten with me. I don't know why she refuses to do so. It makes me a little sad. Still, I'm not about to push the issue, not when she's putting up with all the problems I have. By the way, I asked about your father again. You did? Dr. Ogai Masahiko is Saya's father and her only living relative. Saya has asked me to unravel the mystery of his disappearance. They wouldn't tell me anything. I get the feeling they're hiding something. Oh. I expected Saya to be a little more disappointed. You haven't given up, have you? No. Saya responds with an unreadable expression. It's not that. She gives a little shake of her head and then smiles at me once again. Thanks for all you're doing for me. It's nothing compared to what you've done for me. I thank her for the meal and set my chopsticks down next to the perfectly clean plate. As wretched as the taste was, thinking of the care that Saya put into it gave me the strength to finish every bite. Is it bath time? Yeah. Will you wash my back again? Sure. Ever since Saya moved in, it's been like having my own wife. <laughs> Hello? Bath CGs? Saya. Why are you so good to me? Is this truly what you want? What am I that you can give yourself to me, body and soul? Is this merely sympathy? Do you pity me, the exile from society? Is that enough for you to surrender yourself to such mad desire? Are you so wanton? Saya is here. She is with me, now. Only in this moment is her existence certain. Only when I am joined with her can I believe. No matter what cruel fate might await me, Saya, there's nothing I fear more than losing you. Fuminori, are you crying? I realize that my cheeks are wet with tears. Why, Saya? Why do you go so far from me? Fuminori. I don't understand it. I don't, but I'm losing myself to you more every day. I can't live without you, Saya. I wrap my arms tighter around her, praying that our bodies will melt together and never again be apart. Tell me, please, what must I do to keep you with me? How can I repay you? Sanest med student. <laughs> keep holding me. Saya whispers into my chest. I want to stay like this forever. I won't leave you, Luminari. Why? Why me? Because you're all alone, she says softly, gazing up into my eyes. All alone, just like me. The sorrow in her voice resonates with my own. There is a deep loneliness in her eyes, a loneliness from which now springs boundless affection. You're all I have. In the whole wide world, only you will embrace me, my precious Fuminori. Now I know. 
No matter what horrors this world unleashes upon me, all I ever need is Saya. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if her dad experimented on her. Hmm. Yo is determined to talk to him today. Nothing will happen as long as she hesitates. It will only prolong her suffering. The time has come to show courage once again. It would explain why she looks normal. Yeah, yeah. If, he, if he's seeing like an inversion of the way things are. I mean, it's just theory brain. That's probably not it. Yo's fourth period on Thursdays is biology. This is her one chance to see Fuminori. As a required course with many students, the lecture is held in a large hall that can sw seat well over 200. But since the room is usually only half full, it is really difficult for Yo to see the seat that she wants. Yo prefers to sit near the center where it is easiest to hear the professor. Most of the students congregate in this area for the same reason. <gasps> Fuck. Tip your d fedoras for map pat. That's just a theory. <laughs> Her shirt is so small. Hang on. Fuminori usually sits beside her, although given the ambiguous state of their relationship, she knows better than to take this for granted. Still, she tries to save a seat whenever possible. Oh. The classroom isn't crowded today, so Yo is able to set her back on the seat next to her without inconveniencing anyone. But when the professor arrives at the usual time to start class, there is still no sign of Fuminori. After waiting for about 10 minutes, Yo scans the room furtively. Fuminori is there, sitting alone in the far back corner. Did he miss Yo when he came in? No, he couldn't have. And besides, no serious student would unwillingly sit so far away from the front. Feeling miserable, Yo slides her bag back over to herself. She's literally me! <laughs> Fuminori is out the door the moment class ends. Yo barely manages to catch up to him before he disappears down the hallway. Fuminori! Fuminori jerks at the sound of his name. You would think she just screamed at him. What? He turns to her and asks reluctantly. Now that they are face to face, Yo is painfully aware of how much weight Fuminori has lost. His sunken eyes and protruding cheekbones are a far cry from the features familiar to her. She wonders whether he's under a lot of stress or perhaps not getting enough nutrition. Maybe it's both. He definitely looks more tense than he should. Afraid, even. Though of what, she can't imagine. His eyes move restlessly from point to point, and he refuses to look Yo in the eye. It hurts to see Fuminori this way. What could have changed him so? Today, she reminds herself, rekindling the flame of courage in her heart. Um, I want to talk to you about something. Do you have some time? The courtyard is empty and silent. No one is willing to sit and chat in the cold November air. So what is it? Don't you remember? Yo almost blurts the question but manages to keep her composure. You've been acting strange lately. I'm worried about you. Well, a lot's happened. He smiles like it's nothing, but even that seems forced. He's even standing precisely one pace further away from her than he used to. Is that really all? What more do you want? Yo manages to keep from flinching at the harshness of his tone. It's like you're struggling with something. Rather than answer, Fuminori grinds his toe into the dead grass at his feet, fearing that her determination might flag. Yo lets the words come as they may. It's like there's a terrible weight on your shoulders and it's slowly breaking you. That's how you look at me. That's how you look to me. Oh, really? Fuminori mutters through clenched teeth, no longer trying to deny it or change the topic. 
This is an even clearer signal of rejection than his prior evasiveness. But Yo's determination is strong. Today, at least, she won't back down. It's times like this, she implores, trying to convey the sincerity of her feelings for him, that you need your friends. I feel really bad about your parents. But you're not alone. You have Koji, and Omi, and you have me. Yo can no longer stop the words from pouring from her lips. She fears that if she does not unleash her feelings now, they will be lost forever. I think we can help you, so you don't have to deal with it all by yourself. Even if we can't do anything, just talking to us might make you feel better. I want to help you, we all do, so please tell me- Stop, Uminori shouts, silencing Yo's entreaty. She promises herself that she wouldn't back down, but Fuminori's expression is terrible enough to shatter her resolve. The look in his eyes is not anger or any other warm-blooded emotion. It is hate. Murderously cold hate. Come to think of it, I never gave you an answer, did I? He remembers. He remembers, and he has still treated her so coldly. That is all the answer she needs. If his words stab any deeper, she might very well die. I never saw you in any special way before. When you asked me out, I wasn't sure how to respond. I didn't know how I really felt about you then. Uminori? But now I can give you an answer. I've had plenty of time to think it over, you know? I hate you, Tsukaba. I don't even want to look at you. Don't cry, Yo tells herself, but it's too late to stop the tears from pouring from her eyes. I suppose it's too much to hope I never see you again. We do go to the same school. So just make this the last time you speak to me, okay? Your voice makes me sick. How can you be so cruel? Yo whispers in shock and despair. To which Fuminori twists his lips into a malevolent smile. You should really try thinking for yourself once in a while. I bet it was Koji and Obi's idea, wasn't it? Well, you can play at love all you want, believe me out of it. That's all Yo can take. Even after shedding tears in front of him, she absolutely refuses to let him hear her cry. Any disgrace would be preferable to breaking down here. So she runs, fleeing breathlessly from the courtyard while with Fuminori's cold smile at her back. Oh, <laughs> this, these poor bastards. <laughs> Your life serves zero purpose. <laughs> That's so sad. Omi was the first to catch sight of Yo and Fuminori leaving for the courtyard. Reluctant to interrupt them, but still unwilling to leave them alone, she and Koji ended up watching the whole thing from the shadows. That asshole. Throughout the exchange, Omi was clearly itching to jump out and punch Fuminori in the face. Knowing her temper, Koji uh, kept a firm hold of her arm until the end. If he hadn't, she might very well have done it. Fuminori leaves after Yo, his every step seeming to take an act of willpower. Koji sighs heavily into the once more empty courtyard, but the bitter taste in his mouth will not go away. What's wrong with him? Even Koji cannot forgive Fuminori's treatment of Yo. However, the first thing that he feels is confusion, not anger. Koji has known Fuminori since long before college. Fuminori was never this cruel before. There's no question that the accident changed him. Are you just gonna let this go? I don't want to, but what can we do? Something besides watch, Omi shouts, her face red with fury. I won't be satisfied until I give him a piece of my mind. That won't make Tsukaba feel any su Tsukuba feel any better. But it'll make me feel better. Yo and Omi are best friends, just like Koji and Fuminori. In fact, it was the relationship between Koji and Omi that brought the other two together. Omi's anger is only natural. I'm going to- <laughs> Sorry, there was a chat that made me giggle. <laughs> Give him a piece of your shirt. You had- you have enough. <laughs> I- <laughs> I'm gonna talk to him alone. You don't have to come. You serious? Take care of Yo for me, will you? She's probably really hurt. She'll need someone to be nice to her after she's done crying. Wait, shouldn't we switch jobs? 
You know how I am. If I try to comfort her, I'll end up making it worse. Yeah, you've got a point. Hey. Anyway, just go easy, okay? Ending the conversation before Omi's mood gets any worse, Koji heads off to find Yo. Thank you for the pin message, Reagan. Thank you. <laughs> I feel awful, miserable, but also refreshed. I finally crossed the line. I knew it would come crashing down like this sooner or later. Having become unable to feel anything but disgust for other people, there was no way I could hope to maintain the relationships I'd had before the accident. Today's incident will definitely give back to Koji and Omi, and everyone will be convinced that I've had a major change of character. Honestly, I don't care anymore. At least I probably won't be committed for this. I just need to avoid acting any stranger than I already have. If this puts a rift between me and the others, good. The thought of all the stress I'll bring, I'll avoid brings a smile to my lips. I'm fed up with them sticking their noses into my life. It's like they don't care that they make my gut turn just by being near me. I've been terrified of them until now, but today I struck fear into one of them. In that sense, it's something of a relief, but I'm not entirely without remorse for what happened. The person I just demolished with the verbal equivalent of a nuclear bomb used to be my friend Yo. Even if my senses don't believe it, my mind accepts the theory. I don't have any particular grudge against Yo herself, and I didn't really want to hurt her. In retrospect, perhaps I should have just ignored her outright. Yo was an attractive girl. I certainly didn't think badly of her. To be honest though, I was annoyed when Koji and Omi tried to stick us together. It felt like they were using us as entertainment, and Yo seemed totally oblivious to the fact that she was dancing to their tune. Her cluelessness was irritating. Still, I knew that none of them meant any harm. Back then, I didn't have any reason to hurt others just to get my way. If having a casual relationship with Yo would keep our circle of friends together, I was willing to make that compromise. Now, however, there is no room in my heart for such forbearance. If merely talking to someone is an ordeal, then how can I be expected to show them kindness? These ruminations have left me exhausted. I want to return to Saya as soon as possible, but thinking about the packed trains and crowded downtown streets between here and home saps my spirit. Catching sight of a nearby bench, I sit down and close my eyes to the horrors of the world. I can't do anything about the stink or the noise, but at least I can calm my nerves enough to rest. Mm. Even before the accident, Fuminari was very clinical. When I regained consciousness in T University Hospital Ward, the world was as dark as it is now. I had not yet recovered my sight, even though my eyes and optical nerves were undamaged. Average med student. <sighs> it must have been an after effect of the accident. Blindness was a shock, but now I know that my suffering... Now I know that my suffering then was nothing. After all, my senses of hearing, touch, taste, and smell were all fine at the time. The real horror began when my sight returned. Hello, thank you for the raid, Cyraxis. We're reading Song of Saya. Please read my warnings. <laughs> Welcome. I hope you had a good stream. The one small mercy was that I was able to come to terms with the accident and my neurosurgery while still blind. I panicked when I first saw the nightmarish hospital and the blood-curdling shapes of all the doctors and nurses, but I soon guessed the cause. It chills me to think of what might have happened if I had recovered my sight along with my consciousness, suddenly awakening in what can only be described as hell I no doubt would have lost my mind instantly. Soon my disorder spread to senses of touch, taste, and smell. As it turns out, sight exerts tremendous influence over the other four. The taste of my food, the feel of my bedsheets, the fragrance of my get well flowers, all became as unbearably foul as my eyes said they should be. Eventually, even when the doctor's voices became unrecognizable as human, I decided to kill myself. I didn't believe for a second that I could live in this new world. At least, not until I met Saya. One night, while thinking of a painless way to die, I found myself succumbing to sleep. 
Drifting between the nightmares in my dreams and the nightmare of reality, I didn't notice her enter my room. Hi, baby girl. The next thing I knew, there was a face staring down at me from next to my bed. Her face was not covered in pus or slime or earthworm-like feelers. It had smooth white cheeks, around eyes, a lovely little nose, all things that I had never expected to see again. The face was that of a girl, undeniably human and positively glowing with beauty. Ugh. I sighed in admiration, savoring the first peace and joy since regaining my sight. She had not expected such a reaction, apparently. Aren't you afraid of me? She asked. Looking at the clock, I saw that it was exactly three in the morning. No time for a young girl to be alone in the hospital. Perhaps she expected me to mistake her for a ghost. Bro. Okay, sorry, theory brain. But I would not have cared if she had been a ghost. Either way, she was a godsend. Who are you? What are you doing here? I'm Saya. I'm looking for my dad. I assumed that she was the daughter of a late shift doctor or another patient. It was unusual, but not unthinkable for such a girl to be wandering around the hospital. It's no fun if you're not scared. Wait, I cried, desperate to keep her from leaving. It was only after she turned around that I realized I hadn't thought of what to say next. Well? Her beautiful eyes drew me in, healing my soul to its core. Through the white haze clouding my mind, I struggled to form a coherent sentence. I shouldn't do this to a girl, but you're the only one I can ask. No longer concerned with propriety, I let the words come as they willed. Will you let me hold your hand? Saya looked confused at first, but then smiled like she just found a new toy. Her smile was brighter than my memories of the sun. You're strange, she said, holding out her slender white hand. No one's asked me anything like that before. Ever so carefully, as though catching snowflakes, I placed my palm against hers. I could feel her human warmth and the softness of her delicate fingers. She was there, just beyond the palm of my hand. Thinking back on the joyful tears I shed then, I know that this is the moment I was saved from my fate. Yeah, I don't- I don't think she's carrion. I don't think- She has to have a human form. Because- because, like, she just has to, right? She has to have a form. I don't think she's a... Like, a, a figure of his imagination. I was reading chat. And if she was a figure of his imagination, why would she have a dad? <laughs> my bad, my bad. I can't touch anyone else. I was in an accident, and as a side effect of the surgery, I can't see people as human anymore. Hmm, how mysterious. You're interesting, she said, winding her fingers gently around mine. Can I come back tomorrow night? Yes, of course, but are you sure it's okay? Don't worry, she replied. The night belongs to me. They might have the same disorder. That was kind of what I thought at first. That's why she also doesn't eat probably. And so our rendezvous began. Saya came to my room every night at 3 a.m., skillfully taking advantage of the duty nurse's shift change. That's why I also think her dad experimented on her. Sorry, I'll shut up. I was astonished to learn that she was living inside the hospital. It's so big that I never run out of places to hide, she said, answering my surprise with a nonchalant smile. She had been living in the suburbs with her father, she told me, until one day he'd suddenly stopped coming home. After she had tired of waiting, Saya decided one night to sneak into the hospital where he'd worked. And there she'd lived for over two months, searching for his whereabouts all the while. Don't you have to go to school? No, Dad taught me everything I need to know. I'm really smart. She was a strange girl. On the one hand, she looked and acted like a child. On the other, she was remarkably self-reliant and at times exhibited a sharp intelligence and deep knowledge that many have found unsettling. I didn't care. Saya was the only other human in a world gone mad. Her existence meant far more to me than the standards of society. Aren't you worried you might get caught? No, I don't have to worry about food here, and it's a lot more fun than staying in dad's house by myself. 
I looked through the patient lists and found the ones who have mental problems, Saya continued, grinning mischievously. Sometimes I sneak into the rooms late at night and scare them. Even if they raise a fuss, no one believes what the mental patients say. <laughs> they just brush it off as a bad dream. Her confession reminded me that the hospital was famous for its ghost stories. Who could imagine that there was actually a real girl impishly roaming these hallways? So that's why you came into my room the first time. Yeah, sorry. Are you mad? While her pranks were hardly praiseworthy, I couldn't bring myself to scold her for the very thing that had brought us together. You shouldn't do it anymore. Will you come talk to me instead? Yeah, that's more fun for me too. Good. With extreme care, I was able to conceal my sensory disorder. It was glaringly obvious that the doctors had no way to cure me, and the fact that I had undergone a still experimental procedure made me even more cautious. As a medical student, it was easy for me to imagine how the doctors would react if they had discovered that I was exhibiting such an unusual side effect. I was not about to become a guinea pig, a mere specimen to be examined with clinical detachment. And so I hid my discomfort and loathing behind a mask of normalcy, convincing the doctors that any signs of stress were merely a result of hospitalization. Is there a hotkey to hide the Texas C, the CG? Maybe. Oh, um, I think so. One sec. Space? Cool. Saya was my support. Looking forward to her nightly visits gave me the strength to endure my daily torture. Hope can make an enormous difference in a patient's progress. With the aid of my secret nurse, I recovered at a pace that left the doctor stunned. On the last night before my release, I summoned my courage and asked her, Are you going to stay here forever? Yeah, I couldn't learn anything about my dad, but it's not like I have anywhere else to go. I guess I'll stay as long as I can hide. In other words, there was nothing keeping her there. Why not stay with me? I asked timidly. The question took all the courage I had. Huh? My family's gone, so I have plenty of room. You wouldn't need to hide, and it's not a bad place to live. You want me to live with you? I was too afraid to ask her what she thought of that, so I hastily offered a deal. In exchange, I'll help you look for your father. I'll find him no matter what. I think that's going to be hard, Saya said, looking a little bit embarrassed. Dad probably did something bad and had to leave the hospital. We can't get the police involved. You'll have to be as discreet as possible. I'll do whatever it takes. I... Unable to control myself, I finally spoke the truth. I can't be apart from you. At first she looked bewildered, but after a few moments of silence, she said, Give me a little time. That night, she left my room earlier than usual. On the day of my release, I managed to smile as I accepted the hideous, foul-smelling celebratory banquet. The flesh beasts calling themselves Koji, Omi, and Yo came to pick me up. Although they had come to see me many times during my stay, it never got easier to see my friends change so horribly. My sudden tears of despair drew suspicion but I managed to explain them away as tears of joy. But bouquet Was it banquet? Bouquet- Okay, my bad, my bad. It was bouquet. <laughs> While we walked to Koji's car, I think I Freudian slip chat. I couldn't decide if I want to say banquet or bouquet. Um, I looked desperately for Saya amid the grotesque scenery. Even as we drove away, I kept watching the hospital fade into the distance, praying for a last glimmer of hope. But Saya never appeared. After Coach and the others dropped me off, I paused a while to regard my surroundings. I'd lived my entire life in this block, in this house. There was no, th no other place that I could call home. <laughs> but nothing was as I remembered. As I walked up the path to the front door and took in the yard where I'd spent my childhood, I could feel these memories being defiled by the twisted, festering shapes around me. 
Inside the house, I found nothing familiar, nothing to offer me comfort and warmth. What I had once called home was now a whole other world. I have no home, I whispered with a smile of self-pity. There was one last stop to make, one last nail to hammer into my coffin. I stepped into the room that had cradled me from childbirth, childhood. The walls were papered with human entrails, the bed a tangled mass of worm flesh. But none of that mattered. There, curled up on the bed like an abandoned cat, was Saya. As I stood there in shock, she looked up at me, in a tiny, weak voice said, Can I really stay? I responded by sweeping her into my arms, embracing her tightly so that she would not escape. Saya did not resist. Aw, wholesome. One sec. Saya could be a meat monster, we don't know yet. I think she's a person. I mean, that she also could have just been lying about, like, why she was in the hospital or, like, who her dad is. Oh, yeah, he definitely didn't tell her his address. <laughs> she could have figured that out on her own, though. Hmm. When she arrives at the Sakisaka house, Omi first takes a deep breath to calm herself. Oh shit, what if she sees Saya? Her anger does not vanish entirely, of course, but at least now she can hear herself think. While waiting for a response from the intercom, she looks over the patch of yard that she can see from outside the gate. Even Omi isn't normally one to complain about other people's housekeeping, but this is going too far. The grass is growing wild and there are piles of dead leaves scattered everywhere. It doesn't just look untended, it looks like an uninhabited ruin. It's still light out, but every window has its storm shutters tightly sealed. Omi guesses that they've been closed since morning. What kind of life is, is Fuminori leading? Even if he's living alone, he can't neglect his housework forever. His family all died! They all died! Who cares if he didn't mow his lawn? And is it just her imagination, or does something stink like rotten meat? It couldn't be coming from the yard, could it? There's still no response, so she presses the buzzer a second time, and a third, and a fourth. Finally, after this has gone on for ten minutes, Omi loses her patience and opens the cover of the intercom. As she expected, the power has been disconnected. Perhaps Fuminori has a good reason for shutting out the world, but Omi can only see it as a lack of respect for others. Her anger rekindled, she pushes the gate open and stomps through the yard to the front door. Given the state of his intercom, she doubts that Fuminori will respond to a knock, so Omi decides to just open the door and go in shouting. And if the door is locked, she'll just have to... Omi, no! Surprisingly, the doorknob turns easily in her hand, and the enraged Omi finds herself throwing the door open wider than she intended. Her nostrils are instantly assaulted by a choking stench. What is that smell? As Omi stands petrified on the threshold, the cowbell hanging on the inside of the door chimes loudly. A moment later... Welcome home! Omi can't believe her ears. The voice she just heard could not have been human, yet its intonations were too complex for any animal she could imagine. Is someone there? She calls out to the end of the hallway from which the voice came. There is no response. Instead, she hears the sound of something soft and wet flopping its way deeper into the house. Finding it difficult to place a meaningful image to the voice she just heard, Omi stares blankly at the empty vestibule. There's nothing there, not even Fuminori's shoes, which can only mean that he is still outside somewhere wearing them. The house should be empty. But then what was that voice just now? Her anger has vanished as if it were never there. Nevertheless, Omi sets her foot into the hallway, leaving the door open so that the cowbell won't ring. The floor creaks, setting her nerves on edge. Omi isn't sure why she's acting like a burglar, but something tells her to make as little noise as possible. 
The potency of the stink inside the house makes the whiff she caught outside pale in comparison. It's sickening, like rotten fish guts. Has food been left to spoil in the kitchen? She hears a bubbling sound up ahead. Stepping gingerly on the creaking floorboards, Omi makes her way to the end of the hallway. She finds rooms to both sides of her, one lit, the other dark, and chooses to look into the lit room. It's the kitchen, lit by what must be the only window in the house not covered by a storm shutter. The sound she heard was the pot boiling on the stove and the chopping board next Next to it lies a butcher's knife and some half-diced carrots, a perfectly normal household scene, with the light of the setting sun making everything the color of decomposing fruit. Something is wrong. Who is cooking here, and where did they go? Is anyone here? Omi calls, regretfully, regretting it immediately as she realizes that her voice is shaking. As her words echo vainly through the silent house, she begins to feel foolish and defenseless. Suddenly, she feels something cold seeping through her pantyhose. She timidly reaches down to touch her feet. Her fingertips come away covered in a viscous olive green slime like the filthy water from a tank long clogged with algae and dead fish. The whole floor is covered with it. It must be the source of the stench. Guys, pantyhose is just tights. It's okay. I know it has panties in the name, but it's fine. <laughs> Omi now wishes that she had worn her shoes inside. Manners be damned. When she looks back ruefully the way she came, she realizes that her current position is not visible from the entrance. This kitchen must be where that strange voice came from. The next room is probably the den. As she expected from the closed storm shutters, it's pitch black inside. Omi wants nothing more than to flee this house, but that would mean turning her back to the darkness, and that she simply cannot bring herself to do. Moved by some irrational compulsion, Omi sets foot into the den. It is too dark to see anything, and the stink is far worse than before. She slides her hand along the wall, feeling for the light switch. Finding it much sooner than she expected, she flips it on like it's her last hope. The colors. The colors. So many colors. The purple of entrails, the brown of rotten meat, the crimson of fresh blood, the yellow of fat, these colors and more that cannot be described cover every inch of the room in a maddening array. The colors say all that needs to be said about the painter's hatred, malice, and insanity. <laughs> Omi's legs give out from the shock, sending her to the floor. Slime immediately soaks up through her jeans, its cold tendrils creeping up her legs, crotch, and her neck. Her hands fly to her neck, where it's greeted by another drop of chili slime. Above her, something is dripping down on her head. Making perhaps the worst decision of her life, Omi looks up. The predator clinging to the ceiling, poised to leap upon its prey, she sees it in every detail. Her mouth and nose are sealed before she can scream and her belly is torn open as something enters to feast on her innards. But by the time she feels any of this, Omi has already gone mad. Ooh! Ooh! Oh seven. Oh seven, Omi. I bit the bullet and tried to take the train, but the rush hour crowds were so bad that I had to get off halfway and walk. What is Saya going to say about this? I'm running pretty late. Is Saya worried? I hope she's not mad. When I enter the yard, I realize that the front door has been left wide open. Light from the living room is seeping out into the hallway, and I hear what sounds like someone smacking their lips. There's also a tantalizing fragrance in the air. <gasps> Is it Saya? I consider calling out to her, but I decide to enter in silence instead. Yes! 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, I understand now. Something smells strange, though not unpleasant. The aroma is quite soothing, in fact. It reminds me of Saya's hair. Of course, chat, everything is inverted. That would mean that... No, I'm not excited for cannibalism. I'm ex 
Okay, I'm a little excited for Cannibalism. <laughs> that would mean that... That that things like guts and gore would be appealing to him. At first, I am surprised by what I see in the living room. The floor is covered with what looks to be some kind of grass. Probably the source of the herb-like smell, and there are fruit or vegetable-like balls of varying sizes scattered everywhere. <gasps> Saya? Ah! Saya turns around, her eyes wide with surprise. She then looks away sheepishly, like a child caught at some prank. What are you eating? This is um well. She stammers, so flustered that I suddenly feel bad for sneaking up on her. Remembering that she has never eaten in front of me before, I realize that she must be quite embarrassed. Can I have one? <gasps> I scoop up the closest fruit thing and pop it into my mouth, ignoring Saya's attempt to wave me off. It's a strange texture, soft and pliable like a peach or a pear. When I bite into it with my back teeth, a succulent juice fills my mouth. Combined with a sharp, strong fragrance, it's unlike anything I've ever tasted. How did you make this? What did you use? It wasn't hard. I just took it apart and melted it a little to make it easier to eat. It's practically raw. Oh? I pick up a different lump, this one consisting of fruity flesh around a hard core. Tearing a chunk off in my mouth, I find that it has a similar taste to the last one. Hey, are you okay? That's a... Yeah, even I can eat this. In fact, it's good. Really? At first, Sai looks dumbstruck, but then she bursts out laughing. So this is what you like. Now I feel stupid for going through all that trouble. Is this what you always eat, Saya? Yeah, though it's been a while since I've had one so big, I usually catch them in the nearby park. There's an impressive nature preserve not too far from here. I've never heard about fruits like these growing there, but, well, of course. They only look like fruits to me. They're really something else. <laughs> Put it together! Sorry, I already ate the best parts. That's okay. There's always next time, and now we can eat together. Yeah! Saya seems really happy. I'm happy, too, of course. Eating with someone is much more fun than eating alone, and it makes the food taste better, too. There's still plenty left. It'll keep chilled for two or three days, though it won't taste as good. Then we better start putting it away. Seeing the small f sealing the small fruits in Tupperware and the large ones in pots and bowls, Saya and I store the remaining food in the refrigerator. Thinking of tomorrow's dinner fills me with anticipation. I feel that, little by little, I'm starting to regain the joy of living. Saya will guide me. With her, I can live on. I'm happy for them, chat. I'm happy for them. <laughs> Let me have some water. That's beautiful. Need need something like that. <laughs> True Scary Stories Hospital Edition. Chapter 4, The Monster in the Hospital. A medical student relates his shocking experiences. Will you believe him or not? Strange things started happening at the hospital around the end of last spring. It began with patients waking up in the middle of the night, screaming. They all spoke of terrifying nightmares, and many of them had to be sedated. Some patients even transferred to other hospitals because of it. The weird thing was that they'd all had exactly the same dream. A dream about a horribly disgusting monster staring down at them from their bedside. But the really strange stuff started happening after that. There used to be a lot of stray cats around campus looking for scraps from the students. One day, the cats suddenly disappeared. And it wasn't that they'd stopped coming, it was more like they'd vanished from the area entirely. And then people stopped walking their dogs around. According to rumors, the dogs were refusing to go anywhere near the school. Eventually, things started going missing in the hospital. Organs, to be precise. Transplant organs kept disappearing from storage. People came close to losing their jobs over it, and it wasn't just two or three times that it happened. They tried to keep it from the, from the students, but we heard it was a lot worse than that. 
So she was lying about why she was in the hospital, I think. People started saying that there was something living in the hospital. The janitors would find strange messes that could have only been made in the middle of the night. Traces of something that had crawled down the hallway or weird stains caused by something dripping through the ceiling. The late shift nurses talked about hearing strange sounds on the same nights that patients woke up screaming. There's one story, one that you can never mention inside the hospital. One day, the obs- ob One day, the department went crazy. They said that a newborn had disappeared in the night. If that were true, the police would have come, and it would have been all over the news, but they say the big shots managed to make it all go away. It was just a rumor, of course. Yummy. These strange incidents suddenly stopped towards the end of the summer. Now there are almost no patients complaining of nightmares, and the cats have started coming back to campus. But still, what happened in the hospital that summer? Even now, just thinking about it gives me the creeps. No, it's my first time, Ella Docs. This is Junicore. I'm a huge fan. I can't wait for it to get worse. Nothing. This is the third day in a row that they haven't been able to get in touch with Omi. There's no sign that she returned to her apartment, and even her family doesn't know anything. Her parents have already filed a missing persons report. Well, you know her. She probably just... She'll probably just pop up somewhere, like nothing happened. I hope so, Yo replies with a gloomy expression. She's worried about Omi, of course, but the incident with Fuminori three days ago must still be weighing on her as well. That's right, I do know that there are multiple endings, but I think they only come up, like... Like, there are choices that come, like, near the end. I can just go back and replay for the other endings. Yo hasn't seen Fuminori since then, and Fuminori hasn't made any effort to approach her or Koji. Four people used to meet in this cafeteria between classes, but now there are only two. Hey, Koji, let's keep thinking. Isn't there somewhere Omi might have gone? No. Koji answers evasively. I already checked everywhere. It's a lie, of course. Koji knows where Omi planned to go that evening, but he doesn't want to bring Fuminori up in front of Yo. Their awkward silence is mercifully broken by the bell signaling the start of the next period. Well, I've got to go. Yeah. Actually, I should probably save while we're here. No? I think I technically have, like, one fight. This was, like, when I started it on my own. Yeah, I only played for, like, 15 minutes. I'll just, like, save it in this random ass slot. <laughs> <clears throat> Fuck. Unless Koji is mistaken, Yo is supposed to have class next period, too, but she just sits there, staring off into space. Unable to come up with anything to say, he leaves the cafeteria reluctantly. Both Omi's disappearance and Yo's depression worry Koji, and both problems lead back to the exact same place. What the hell is Fuminori doing? When Omi went missing, the first thing he did was question Fuminori. After all, the last time he'd seen her was just before he, she stormed off to give Fuminori a piece of her mind. Fuminori responded with unequivocal denial and acted like he hadn't the slightest idea why Omi would have gone to see him. Perhaps that was only natural, as he was unaware that Omi and Koji had witnessed him reduce Yo to tears. Did Omi even make it to Fuminori's house? She had been riding a wave of emotion when she left, and might have calmed down and changed her mind halfway there. Or perhaps she ran into trouble on the way. Koji concluded, or more accurately, convinced himself, that one of these possibilities was the truth, subconsciously denying the one remaining possibility, that Fuminori was lying, that he had met Omi, and was involved in her disappearance. When questioned by the police, Koji told the truth about Omi's destination only up to the train station, maintaining that he had no idea where she planned to go after that. He wanted to cooperate with the search, of course, but Omi couldn't have made it to Fuminori's house. Fuminori said so himself, didn't he? In that case, he told the police everything they needed to know. 
Hang on. Blech. I just splashed on my face. What the fuck? Not wanting to, ex to get the still fragile Fuminori involved, he forced himself to accept this flimsy logic. But the conflict had built up inside him without his notice, leaving unanswered suspicion to fester in his mind. Koji is deep in thought, paying no attention to his surroundings, but perhaps that is what allows him to catch sight of his friend's back through the crowd of milling students. Fuminori? At first, Koji assumes that he's headed off to the lecture hall, but it soon appears that he is instead going home. Strange. Medical students have required courses in the afternoon. Though he is initially surprised, Koji's hesitation lasts only for a second. He follows his friend, taking care to stay far enough behind that he won't be noticed. Not you too, bro. Not you too. No. Wait, 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 wait. Fuminori wasn't going home, as became obvious when he boarded a train heading in the opposite direction. Koji's next guess was that he was going to see his doctor at T University Hospital, but Fuminori rode straight through the closest through the closest station. Where's he going? At first, Koji felt ashamed for tailing his friend like this, but his conscience fell silent as Fuminori's actions grew more mysterious. The stranger it gets, the closer Koji feels to discovering the truth behind Fuminori's sudden transformation. Any knowledge would be welcome, no matter how slight. Even Koji is beginning to think that there must be more behind Fuminori's change than the accident alone. He wants a more satisfying answer, one that will help him decide whether Fuminori can still be trusted. Fuminori gets off- Oh no, he's going to the park. At a small station in a nondescript suburb of Tokyo, Koji follows, trying not to lose sight of him amid the other disembarking passengers. The area is quite desolate, with only a small bookstore, a convenience store, and a market in front of the train station. It's easy for Koji to keep Fuminori in view. This neighborhood was carved out of the Fuji foothills, and here and there remain steep inclines and wooded areas that escaped assimilation. Koji is amazed that such a quiet place exists less than an hour out of central Tokyo. Fuminori seems to know these streets. He moves quickly and purposefully through the suburban community, his eyes fixed straight ahead. Before long, Fuminori reaches a house. Without ringing a bell or even knocking, he opens the door and vanishes inside, leaving Koji to wonder how Fuminori can treat this house as his own. Weird. After waiting to see if Fuminori comes back out, Koji approaches the gate and checks the nameplate. Oh, guy, it reads. Koji has never heard of anyone by that name among Fuminori's acquaintances. Ah, oh, I see. Next, his attention is drawn to the thick wad of leaflets sticking out of the mail slot. This, coupled with the general dilapidated feel of the place, suggests that this has been abandoned for quite some time. A small playground about two blocks away provides an adequate vantage point from which to watch the front of the Ogai home. Fortunately, it does not appear to be the sort of house that has a rear exit. Monka. Koji settles down on a bench to begin his stakeout. I should have brought more smokes. One hour passes, then another, but there are no remains no sign of movement around the Ogai residence. Soon, twilight settles upon the neighborhood. After Koji's one pack of cigarettes runs out, the stakeout becomes a battle against mounting impatience. He kills time by redialing Omi on his cell and sending her short text messages, but his efforts are futile, as he knew they would be. When the sky begins to turn a deep blue and the streetlights come on, Fuminori finally emerges from the house and heads back towards the station with the same hurried stride. After some brief consideration, Koji decides that right now, investigating the house is more important than tailing Fuminori. He rings the doorbell just to make sure. After receiving the expected silence in response, he checks to make sure no one is watching and turns the doorknob. The door is not locked. Mm. 
The moment he enters the house, stale air thick with mold and dust fills Koji's nostrils. It is the unmistakable smell of a house that is long laid untouched. There's also a faint hint of something else in the air, something reminiscent of damp sewers and fetid cisterns. Flipping the light switch does nothing. The power must be cut off. Koji uses a cigarette lighter to illuminate the immediate area. In the thick dust covering the floor, he sees several brand new trails of footprints that could have only been made by shoes. Fuminori's. Koji decides to follow suit and dispense with courtesy. He enters with his shoes on. The lighter's flickering flame pushes back the deathly silence in the gloom of the house. Koji is surprised to see evidence of life remaining. Everything from furniture to tableware to appliances. Nothing seems to be missing. The thickness of the dust suggests that the house has been empty for several months, which means that the owner must have left with little more than the clothes on his back. Could he have gone on a long vacation? The calendar in the den is still turned to April. Empty and silent, yet still exhibiting signs of the life that was once lived here, the house reminds Koji of a passenger ship entombed at the bottom of the sea. In the graveyard-like quiet, a sinister thought suddenly enters his mind. No one is living here, but that does not have to mean that the owner has left. Maybe he was murdered, and his rotting corpse is right under Koji's feet. He finds himself wanting a stronger light. A flashlight in his hand would make him feel much better. Koji follows Fuminori's footsteps to the second floor, where he begins to catch the scent of paper in the stale air. It is the scent of old books, instantly recognizable to anyone who has worked in an antique store or library. The first room on the second floor turns out to be a study, its towering shelves packed with such a vast number of books that Koji fears for the stability of the floor. As a medical student himself, he is able to discern at a glance that the study belongs to a medical professional, and a high-level one at that. Judging by the contents of the books, a smorgas smorgasbord of technical volumes far beyond a simple student's understanding. The owner's interests lie more with medical research than with clinical practice. Fuminori must have spent most of his time here. The scattered dust suggests that he was searching for something, and the contents of the desk drawers are in obvious disarray. A small pile of books stacked on one side of the table catches his eye. Being next to the desk, they must have been the most frequently read. Their nature could shed some light on the character of the person who worked here. Koji frowns as he examines the three books. These aren't scientific texts like the rest, but rather old, leather-bound western tomes like the sort you would find in a rare bookstore. The titles are meaningless to him. Tre- Guys, I can't speak baguette. Should I- De- de, de shif it appears to concern semiotics, but uh, Magna et Ultima is some kind of tre treatise on divination? Divination? It's Latin. This, the, is the top one Latin? That looks like French to me. Am I wrong? Whatever. And then there's Voynich Manuscript, which looks like the sort of picture book. Some sort of picture book. When he pages through it, he finds the text utterly incomprehensible. Maybe it's some kind of cipher. Did he summon Saya? Whatever they are, they clearly have nothing to do with medicine, refuting Koji's earlier guess that this Ogai was a doctor. Looking down, Koji suddenly notices the glint of something black and metallic under the chair. A pocket-sized flashlight, quite out of place among these dusty books. Fuminori must have brought it in. With relief, Koji exchanges his lighter for the flashlight. Its tiny body emits a powerful white beam that casts away the darkness. His courage restored, he decides to explore the rest of the house. Hmm? Hmm? Koji notices something strange. Something that was not visible in the lighter's weak flame. The slime. Dark, oily stains are everywhere. The stains are especially thick around the doorknobs and stair banisters, like someone grasped them with their hands wrapped in greasy cloth. Looking closer, he sees places where slime was splashed low on the walls, as if a wet mop was run violently across the floor. Uh, could Ovgai have made these marks? If so, how? Koji begins to feel sick as he imagines a man shambling through the house with slime dripping from his body. 
Finding the bedroom next to the study, Koji checks the closet on a hunch. He discovers two empty suitcases, not what one would leave behind when going on a long vacation. A sudden chill runs through him. Whoever was living here is still somewhere inside the house. Suppressing the urge to flee, Koji goes back downstairs to check the first floor. If he finds a corpse, he'll have to call the police right away. He might get away with trespassing if he reports at first, but if they find the body later, it'll be awfully hard to explain his fingertips all over the house. The flashlight reveals the den to be covered in even more slime than the rest of the house. The sofa looks as though it was dredged from the bottom of a swamp. Why suppress the urge to flee? Is he stupid? In the kitchen, Koji takes one look at the sink and decides not to get any closer. He doesn't want any more fuel for his imagination. He reaches for the door to the bathroom. A common scene from TV dramas flashes through his head. A body with slit wrists floating in a bathtub full of water. And there wasn't a movie where a hitman disposes of his victim in a bathtub. Wasn't there a movie when a hitman disposes his victim in a bathtub full with lie? Koji braces himself for the worst and opens the door slowly, and then shines his light into the ceramic bathtub that appears from the darkness like a white ghost. Bones. A mountain of bones. Black with dry flesh and blood. Koji puts one hand against the wall to steady himself as his legs threaten to buckle. Something is wrong, he realizes, as he tries desperately to get his thoughts in order. The bones are too small, and there are too many of them. They aren't human. After taking several deep breaths to calm himself, Koji enters the bathroom and examines the tub. The bones are piled atop each other like fallen leaves. They appear to be from small animals, perhaps cats or dogs. Even so, the quantity is mind-boggling. How many bodies would it take to produce this many bones? The bones have all been separated from one another, so it doesn't look like bodies were just thrown into the tub and left to rot. Each bone is covered in deep grooves. Marks left by teeth biting through flesh. Koji's sanity won't let him consider the possibility that a human could have done this. The owner of this house must have kept some sort of carnivorous animal as a pet, giving it the bones of small animals to eat and the disposing of the remains in the bathtub. Why not dispose of the leftovers properly? They could have been thrown out with the garbage, or was there something keeping him from leaving the house? The relief Koji felt when he realized that the bones weren't human is once again under attack. In the first place, what the hell was Fuminori doing here? Oh shit! <laughs> What's wrong, Koji? <laughs> Koji whirls around, his light revealing Fuminori's expressionless face. You're trespassing. So, so are you? Koji replies, barely managing to speak over the pounding of his heart. Fuminori pushes past Koji and looks into the bathtub. He doesn't even flinch at the sight of the bones. A friend of mine lives here. I'm just running an errand. What? Who is this person? Where did you meet them? Koji doesn't want to believe that the old friendly Fuminori could have contact with the denizens of this house. I'll introduce you one of these days, he says, turning to leave without even a glance at Koji. I owe her my life. Hey, Fuminori! Koji runs after Fuminori, his heart finally beating normally again. Wait, is this friend of yours the reasons you've been acting so strange? Standing in the entrance, Fuminori glares coldly at Koji over his shoulder. The utter lack of emotion in his eyes gives Koji pause. You followed me, didn't you? What a wet swallow that was. <laughs> Koji swallows. What else can he say? You're starting to bother me, Koji. Don't do it again. Fine. Fuminori walks away without another word, leaving Koji alone in the entrance. Up until this very moment, concern for his friend was still at the forefront of his mind. Now, however, that concern is swiftly giving way to a growing sense of dread. Does the Fuminori he knew no longer exist? Was the person who just stared Koji down an imposter wearing Fuminori's skin? Koji has begun to believe that it might be so. Hmm. Quick pause.
<laughs> okay. We got like 20 minutes. Also, God, this this game is a really good OSD. <clears throat> What a nuisance. Why does he insist on interfering? If he only spoke with me to exchange pleasantries, even I could bear it. But now he's sticking his nose into my business just to satisfy his curiosity. Koji is a perfect example of someone who thinks that it's always good to take an interest in other people's affairs. He probably thinks that he's doing me a favor by prying into my life. He couldn't be more wrong. If he keeps this up, I might have to find some other way to deal with him. Like Saya said, I have to do my research for Doctor. I have to keep my research for Doctor Ogai a secret. Koji could ruin everything. I didn't have time to fully investigate the Ogai residence today. At this rate, it will probably take several days just to go through the study. Saya didn't believe that I'd find anything to help with the research, but I think there's a lot to explore. Who knows what I'll discover? The problem is Koji. He knows about the house now. Will he make things difficult? Excuse me. A hair-raising voice calls as I'm about to pass through my gate. Suppressing a shudder, I put on a fake smile and turn to face the writhing mass of rotten flesh that is staring at me with bulging eyes. Good evening. Are you just getting home? Yes, I am. Ah, of course. This is my next-door neighbor, Suzumi, a middle-aged painter, I think, who spends all day at home while his wife works. I haven't had much contact with him since the accident. Why is he suddenly talking to me now? Have you gotten used to living alone? It's go It's an HOA narc, no way. Yes, thank you for your help. I know it must be very difficult, but you're still young. How, you try to move on with your life? You have to try to move on with your life. Yeah. What is this? Did he stop me just to deliver a lecture? Dude, he's about to talk about your lawn! With such a big house, it must be hard to take care of everything yourself. Yes, I suppose it's rather difficult. Why not hire a caretaker? Didn't your father have one? I'm still a student. I can't really afford the expense. I see. The flesh beast undulates foully. As though it still has something to say. The sight of it is driving me close to the edge. Even so, don't you think you should at least tend to your yard? I'd be happy to help. No, thank you. I'll manage it on my own. Now I get it. He's worried that the unsightliness of my house might diminish the idea of his own. Damn snob. Guy, the HOA, it just occurred to me that I think this might be... Like an American thing. But it's like, it's like an organization that'll hound you to keep your property, like, looking good in order to preserve the value of it. I don't know, I don't know if they have an equivalent in Japan, but either way, I think it's sort of a universal experience that some neighbors want your house to look nice. I flash a token smile, then retreat behind the safety of my gate. I can feel Suzumi's eyes boring into my back all the way to the front door. Why won't everyone stay out of my life? I just want to live together with Saya, alone where no one will ever bother us. Suzumi Yosuke sighs in annoyance as he watches the neighbor boy retreat into his house. What's with his attitude? Even while talking, he kept his eyes averted, as if to avoid looking at something repulsive. Has he always been such an unpleasant young man? No, of course not. When his parents were still alive, he had been a normal youth. A little shy, but sensitive and caring. Must be the stress of his sad situation. If it continues to build, he might start to develop serious mental problems. <laughs> or is it too late already? Yosuke wonders as he gazes wearily at the Saki Saka yard. In Japan, they have the Ochaban Council, and that's like an equivalent, maybe? Even during dinner, Yosuke can't shake the neighboring house from his mind. What's wrong, honey? You look like something's bothering you. Yeah, I saw the young man from next door today. Uminori? I just had to say something about his yard. I know, I'd wish, I wish he'd at least do something about the smell. 
The stink coming from the Sakisaka house grows worse each day, and the Suzumi family is at wit's end. Could there be a dead cat in the bushes? He must have noticed the smell coming from his own yard. Maybe he's leaving his garbage out there. He wouldn't. No, I wouldn't put it past him. Who knows what he's doing in there? All day with the storm shutters closed? What kind of life is he leading? Did he go crazy? Now, Hiromi, you shouldn't say things like that. Honestly, with the way things are going, I'm starting to wonder if he's gone paranoid or something. Will he be alright? Unless he gets help soon. Who knows? The seconds crawl by, each tick of the clock compounded by compounding my agony. When I returned from the Ogai residence, I was greeted by a silent, empty home. Saya had vanished without leaving any clues as to her whereabouts. She's hunting, bro. She's hungry. It isn't rare for her to go for walks at night. I've often gone with her. However, such outings always take place in the middle of the night, when no one is around, and never last for more than two hours. Right now, it's five in the morning. Soon the sky will begin to show the first light of dawn. Even if she left right before I returned, she's still been gone for almost half a day. I can't sleep. I can only wait in anguish. I tried to distract myself by painting more rooms, but I couldn't concentrate on the work. If I had known this would happen, I would have left the Ogai house sooner. I wish I hadn't wasted time on Koji. If Saya doesn't return, the thought makes me want to tear out my hair. After its long absence, the terror of true loneliness is too much to bear. At last, the cowbell chimes, and Sai's long-awaited I'm home rings out from the bottom of the stairs. As I jump out of my bed in relief, all the stress that had been built up through the night is released in a wave that threatens to sweep me off my feet. Ah, oh, so tired. Saya sighs as she climbs up the stairs. I knew the trip would be hard. Saya, where have you... My question trails off as I notice the thick bundles of paper she's carrying under her arms. What are those? Your medical charts and surgery records. I went back to the hospital today. Saya drops her bundles on the floor, sending paper flying everywhere, then pulls her favorite cushion over and collapses onto it, stretching luxuriously. You walked all the way back from the hospital in the middle of the night? Sorry, she says, skillfully gathering the scattered papers together. I meant to come back sooner, but there were so many files to go through. So I just decided to bring everything. It was so heavy. Maybe it's just the exhaustion, but I'm not understanding a word Saya's saying. What are you planning to do with all of this? <laughs> At the what? <laughs> What do you mean? I'm going to study it, of course, she replies, holding one MRA photo- Oh no. Holding one MRI photograph after another into the light. I'll have plenty of time to go over it here. At first I think she's just playing around, but the occasional mutters of, ah, better check this one. Oh, I see. Well, that was silly of them. And the like, as she separates photos into a growing pile beside her, make me think that this might not be a joke after all. What is she doing? Do you understand this stuff? I learned a lot from Dad. She flashes me a grin, then returns to the papers. Hmm, so that's how it is. No wonder it can't be fixed. It can't? Not by a human, Doctor. I can't tell if she's being serious. Even for me, it'll probably be tough. Oh. She says offhandedly, even as her hands continue to shuffle papers. I'll have to experiment first. Watching more closely, I realize that her eyes are scanning each page rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that I was unable to notice it at first. Could Saya actually be reading my charts? Hey, Saya? Yeah? She answers coolly, looking up from the charts. I'm tired. Let's go to bed. Sure, Saya replies with a grin, if that's what you want. Oh shit! Saya tosses the paper she was sorting and then leaps on me and begins to tear off my clothes. Uh oh. Hey, hey, hey. Come on, just once before bed, okay? Is it Seg's time? 
Should I check and make sure it's actually stream? I know it's, I know it is. I think it is because it's the Steam version. But I'm gonna save just in case. <laughs> She's so hungry. Is it sex time? It wouldn't hurt to take the game off screen for a bit. I could just load it if it's if I could I could check it. I'll check it, chat. Cause I know it's like probably safe. But I wanna look. <laughs> I wanna look and make sure with my own eyes. Besides, I saved, so we could just reload it. Mm. Oh yeah, they super like censor it. Okay, I, like there's nothing. There's literally nothing. I'll just load it. <laughs> I had to check. Load time. After this, I'm gonna call it though. Cause I got shit to do tonight and we're about at two hours and my throat's starting to get funny. Saya tosses the paper she's sorting the leaps on me because to tear off my clothes. Hey, hey, come on, just before bed. Uh, once before bed, okay? Hey, Saya, don't you think it's unhealthy to be doing this every day? Huh, are you sick? No, not me. My body is all grown up, but you're... <sighs> Uh, don't worry. She laughs playfully as she pushes me onto the bed, the familiar sweet sensation of her weight and skin rendering me helpless. But I'm worried. We haven't used any contraception. Buminari, she whispers, staring straight into my eyes. You don't want me to have your children? How can I respond to that? It's not that. Your body's too small. Pregnancy is a serious burden. That's not really something you have to worry about. Saya seems unsure how to reply, but not because she doesn't understand what I said. Rather, the bemused look on her face makes it seem as though I'm the one not getting it. But I know you're just thinking of me, she says suddenly, her smile glowing with innocence, so I'm happy. By the time I break the spell of her angelic smile, Saya has undone my belt and is removing my pants. C come on, relax, she says. Tonight, I'll do it so you don't have to worry. As she finishes, she looks up at me, smiling like she just pulled the greatest prank of her life. See? You don't have to worry if I do it like this. Oh, well, uh, what am I supposed to say to that? Hey, was it bad? It didn't feel good? Hearing the sudden nervousness in Saya's voice, I hastily stammer, uh, of course it felt good. But Saya, you don't have to do that. But I want it. Good prank. Good prank, Saya. That was a funny as fuck one. <laughs> Saya claims to be like a child who's just had her candy stolen. I want you inside me. I inside you! So Saya really does want to bear my child. I'm not averse to the idea. I still think it might be too early, of course, but there isn't any point in worrying about my reputation now. Assuming that Saya and I will be left alone, I even welcome it. You don't like it? She gazes up at me pleadingly. How can I resist? I do like it. As long as you're okay with it, so am I. We're brain fucking this guy. <laughs> we're <laughs> we're gonna ruin his life. <laughs> Saya smiles with relief and burrows contentedly into my chest. I love you, Fuminori. She purrs softly. With her body draped over mine, I become even aware of how light and delicate she is. Can this tiny girl and I really live as a husband and wife? I feel a pang of self-loathing at the question. How can I still be afraid after all that's happened? Sai's feelings are so earnest. How can I not accept them? She, she's just petite, chat. She, she's just petite. <laughs> she's not even real. <laughs> she's a freaking monster. <laughs> I need to resolve once and for all to rid myself of this useless trappings. I'm, that's, that's, I'm copiuming, okay? She's just petite. I need... <clears throat> Sai and I are all that matters. There's no point in worrying about what others think anymore. 
Although I suppose I should still talk to Sai's guardian, of course. I need to find Dr. Ogai as soon as possible. <laughs> By the time I drift to sleep and exhaustion's comforting embrace, all doubts about Sai's actions have vanished from my mind. Whatever the case, all that matters is that she's returned to me. Copium. <laughs> Two o'clock. For Suzumi Yosuke, this is the most fulfilling time of the day. After seeing his wife and daughter off, taking care of the morning chores, and eating a leisurely lunch, it's finally time to sit down at his easel. Something horrible is gonna happen to this guy! <laughs> He's not a particularly popular painter, and he would only hold an exhibition if he were hurting for money. However, the design work he does on the side ensures that there's always enough to support his lifestyle. Alongside the salary his wife earns working for a magazine, they're able to pay their mortgage, send their daughter to school, and still have plenty left over. Yosuke's life is perfect, leisurely and absent of want. He loves his house, considering it the symbol of his success. When he mows the lawn, polishes the windows and floors, and cleans the kitchen, toilet, and bath, he feels the same joy as he does when watching, washing his own body. Just as he knows the length of his fingernails and the time since his last meal, he also knows everything about his home's condition. The status of every floor, freshness of every flower, the amount of ice in the ice tray, every last detail. He sounds mentally ill. He sounds like a different kind of mentally ill, I'm gonna be honest. This is his pride, and when he sits in his studio, smelling the turpentine and knowing that each element of his house is in perfect order, he feels the ultimate satisfaction. <laughs> Yoshikage Kira! <laughs> While trying to find the right combination of paints in his palette, he suddenly feels thirsty, but soon remembers that there isn't much orange juice left in the refrigerator. In fact, it's also about time to stock up on bath additive and powdered soap. He can get everything at the supermarket when he goes to shop for dinner, but it will still probably be quite heavy. Now then, where should I leave? Where should I leave off to go shopping? As he ponders this dilemma, he heads downstairs to the kitchen. Just then, a breath of air tickles the back of his neck, bringing him to a halt in the middle of the hallway. A breeze. Impossible. Every window in the door is closed. Yosuke shut them himself during his morning cleaning. Yosuke enters the living room, searching for the source of the breeze. Something stinks. It's the same pungent smell of fetid swampland that emanates from the Sakisaka house. The window faced in the yard next to the, next to the door is open, its curtains billowing loosely in the gentle breeze. There's a hole in the glass next to the lock. It looks strange, like it was melted by some chemical instead of broken. Someone must have reached through the hole to unlock the window. Oh, you poor bastard. Yosuke stands paralyzed, his heart pounding with anger and fear. He listens carefully but hears nothing. Perhaps the intruder? has already finished his business and left, but a burglar wouldn't have left the room untouched, would he? Maybe he heard Yosuke coming and hid, somewhere nearby. Yosuke realizes that his still wet palette knife is in his right hand. He must have forgotten to put it aside before going downstairs. He stares numbly at the knife for a moment, then decides that it's not enough protection. Instead, he grabs the ashtray sitting on top of the table. Made of thick, solid glass, it is big and heavy enough to serve as a weapon. The home that he thought of as part of himself now seems utterly alien. Keenly aware of the thumping of his heart, Yosuke looks around the living room and sees little that could be used as a hiding place. The intruder must have gone either to the guest room or through the dining room to the kitchen. The kitchen is close to the stairs. If there had been movement, Yosuke would have noticed it when he came down, which means that the guest room is the most likely place. He shuffles over the, to the guest room door and prepares to slide it open. What is that stench? Could the breeze alone carry something so foul? It's as if the odor is coming from inside the room. He readies his ashtray and throws open the door. The straw matted Japanese style room is empty. There is a closet, but no one could fit in there. So the intruder already left. Yosuke relaxes. The exhaustion of sudden relief coming over him. And that is when something seizes his ankle. 
the instant he freezes in shock, his yag, his yag, his leg is yanked out from under him, sending him crashing to the floor. Stars explode behind his eyes as his head smacks against the door rail. The hand, if it can even be called that, wrapped around Yosuke's ankle, extends all the way back to beneath the living room sofa. There are barely five centimeters between the sofa and floor. Whatever is hiding there, it can't possibly be human. Do I want slow mode on? No? Why? No. Before the screaming Yosuke can regain his footing, countless hand-like appendages seize his arms and legs, rendering him helpless. Calm down. Don't be scared. As the hideous voice burbles in his ear, something cold and soft crawls atop him. Yosuke can't even scream. His terror is so great. It won't hurt. Don't be scared. It won't hurt. Thin, tube-like appendages penetrate his ears and nose, wriggling deep into his skull. Right before the sensation drives him, his, <laughs> drives him mad, Yosuke loses consciousness. She is experimenting. She's sticking her little tubes in his brain. Hmm. Oh, it's the doctor! Okay, we read one more little chapter. I want to see the doctor again. It's been a hot minute. Thank you for taking the time to see us, Koji says, his humble brow concealing his surprise at the doctor's youth. Even without her light makeup, she wouldn't look a day over 30. She must be quite talented to be a leading neurosurgeon at such a young age. Don't mention it. I was hoping somebody like you would come along. Hey guys, at the very beginning of the game, I thought she really looked like Saya. Like she has the same eyes and hair color. I don't think it means anything. I think it's just a coincidence. Her friendly smile has none of the coldness one might expect from her sharp, refined beauty. It's a pleasure to meet you. I'm Dr. Tanbo, Sakisaka Fuminori's attending physician. I'm Fuminori's friends. Koji, this is Yo. Yo gives a quick bow, her expression apologetic. When they arrived at the T University Medical Center and asked to see Fuminori's doctor, Koji and Yo had been prepared for rejection. They hadn't expected the ease with which their request was granted. You say you want to know what's wrong with him. Well, so do I. I'm sorry? He didn't come in for his checkup two days ago. I tried calling his home, but there was no answer. Two days ago, the same day Fuminori was searching that abandoned house, Koji frowns, wondering what was so important for him to blow off his appointment. That's a- yeah, that's a straight-up HIPAA violation. Relax! What's he like at school? He's totally messed up. Seeing Yo's shoulders jerk out of the corner of his eye, Koji regrets not choosing his words more carefully. Since the accident, he's been like a completely different person. We have no idea what to do. So we thought that talking to you might help. Are you medical students too? She asks out of nowhere. Huh? Well, yes. Would you like to see his chart? <gasps> Girl, you can't do that! Yeah, I guess I don't know what they have in Japan. You'd really show it to us? Koji replies, incredulous. Dr. Tambo regards him silently for a moment, then sighs and says, Somebody wanted to see it, and without the hospital's permission. His files were stolen from an archive two nights ago. What? She stares hard at the astonished students, and then shakes her head with a tired smile. Well, it doesn't look like you two are involved. That's a relief. Uh, of course we aren't. However, the culprit must have had an interest in his condition, or wanted to erase his records. Either way, I can only assume that it was someone close to him. I see. An ominous thought flashes through Koji's mind. It couldn't have been Fuminori himself, could it? Koji looks at Dr. Tanbo and finds her staring right back at him, her expression grave. He realizes she must be harboring the same suspicion. What do you think? Do you have any idea who might have done it? Perhaps Dr. Tenbo didn't have anyone in mind when she asked, but Koji's thoughts immediately fly to that eerie house to which Fuminori led him. 
I don't really know what their relationship is, but there's someone called Ogai? Probably a doctor or a... Koji stops speaking as he sees the dramatic change that has come across Dr. Tanbo's expression. You know Dr. Ogai? Do you know when and where Fuminori met that man? No, that's what I'd like to know. Just who is this Ogai? After remaining silent for some time, Dr. Tanbo loses a heavy sigh. Alright, it's not like you couldn't find out on your own. Okai Masahiko is a doctor teaching at this hospital. He was dismissed over six months ago following certain incidents. What incidents? What did he do? I can't say anymore. And anyway, it has nothing to do with your friend. Koji has no argument with which to answer Dr. Tanbo's flat rejection. However, he can't shake the feeling that this Ogai person is key to unraveling the mystery surrounding Fuminori. Doctor? He says, making up his mind, Fuminori might be involved in a crime. <laughs> At this sudden declaration, both Yo and Dr. Tanbo raise their eyebrows. What do you mean? A friend of ours went missing after going to see him. Fuminori denies any involvement, of course. You mean... Omi? Koji is unable to bear the shock in Yo's voice. Sorry, Sukuba. I couldn't tell you. Dr. Tenbo is frowning, her expression even more serious than before. Right now, this Ogai seems to be the center of Fuminori's attention. If we know who he is and what Fuminori is looking for, we might start to see the whole picture. Please tell us, Doctor. Please tell us what happened at this hospital. Dr. Tempo hesitates for some time, refusing to make eye contact, but she finally shakes her head. I'm sorry. This is not a decision I can make on my own. Doctor, give me some time. I'll do my own investigating, now that I know how far this has gone. Please. Koji's out of options. All that's left is to trust this young doctor. It's frustrating, but a friend's rights only go so far. Let's exchange cell phone numbers. I'll call you if I learn anything, and you call me the moment anything changes. All right. Hello? Oh! That's a good place to stop. Oop, not like that. Yay! Yippee! That was fun. That was fun. That was exciting. <laughs> Yippee! My favorite part was when he ate Omi. <laughs> unique horror i'm invested this is fascinating i i love psychological horror it's my favorite genre of everything everything and anything you understand you get it all right let's find somebody to raid can we raid alex who's playing hollow knight sure 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 Bug on bug. Uh, fuck. Fuck, I don't know how to spell. Yeah, I'll be... I'll probably do continue this next Saturday. Bug on bug. Oh, there we go. I found her. <clears throat> uh, okay. Tomorrow. Just chatting. Uh... And then next week, normal schedule again. We have to finish. Okay, here, I'll start, I'll start raid. Uh, we really don't have like a whole lot of housekeeping to do, to be perfectly honest. Not until I post a schedule for people to see. Um, no Dawn of Ganymede until the 24th. Uh, just like some like things came up and like Brett's going to be out of town and stuff like that. So uh, no Dawn of Ganymede. However, uh, other than that, we're going to be on normal schedule. At least normal new schedule, which means I am going to be doing these Saturday streams more. Um, and yeah, uh, apparently I have 
people are saying I might have like two or three more streams out of this uh, game visual novel, which makes sense because uh, reading out loud is a lot slower than reading in your head. I'm fine with that. And then after that, um, I'll find something else for this slot. We'll see. Probably two tops. Probably three. Well, that's confusing. Uh, anyways, thank you for hanging out with me tonight. I hope you guys have a really good weekend. I will see you guys tomorrow uh, for normal just chatting, technician stream, etc. Okay, I'm going to read now. I will see you guys. I'll kiss you guys on the forehead. Good night. Mwah! And send you guys on your way. All right? Go get him. Go get him, tiger.